Lakeland Public Television, the Bemidji Pioneer, the Brainerd Dispatch, and Northern Community Radio are proud to present Debate Night 2016, a look at our area legislative candidates. And now the State House of Representatives District 2A debate. Your moderator tonight is Warren Larson. Good evening and welcome to Debate 2016, 11 state legislative debates over four nights. We're at Lakeland Public Television Studios in Bemidji. Our candidates for tonight's debate are Jerry Loud from the Democratic Farm Labor Party and Matt Grussell from the Republican Party. Our panel this evening is Dennis Wyman from Lakeland Public Television News Director, Matthew Ledke from the Bemidji Pioneer Reporter, and Scott Hall, the Public Affairs Director for Northern Community Radio, KAXE and KBXE. Our rules for tonight's debate. Each candidate will be given three minutes for opening comments. The panel will ask questions after opening comments. Some will be their own questions, others may be from the public. The candidates will rotate the order they speak, beginning with opening comments and finishing with closing comments. Each candidate gets two minutes to answer the questions. Each candidate will have a one minute rebuttal opportunity. New this year, candidates will have the option of using one minute of bonus time to add on to one of their answers tonight. This can be used during the answer to the initial question or during the rebuttal, but can only be used once. Questions continue until we are about 50 minutes into the debate when we will move on to closing comments. Each candidate will be given two minutes for closing comments. So let's start the debate. Our, um, uh, the first person to do the opening comments will be Jerry Loud. Well, thank you. I just want to thank everybody for this opportunity to uh, uh, debate and talk about the issues that are facing uh, District 2A. I was born and raised in Bemidji, Minnesota. Uh, my father is Clarence Loud. Uh, he was a full-blood Ojibwe uh, from the Red Lake Nation. He was also a World War II veteran. My mother, Donna Loud, uh, she is from Laverne, Minnesota, and she's a full-blood Caucasian, and uh, she worked 44 years at the Northwest uh, uh, North Country Regional Hospital, which is amazing. Uh, I have three full-grown daughters. One of the I wanted to do real quick is to go over some of my qualifications, why I feel I would be the uh, <clears throat> candidate to serve District 2A. Um, I am a, a GED graduate. Uh, I graduated at Anoka in Bemidji Tech. Uh, I served in the U.S. Navy for 10 years. Uh, I was on the USS Enterprise. I did a world cruise and a Pacific cruise. I'm also a Desert Storm veteran. And I, en I enlisted in the Advanced Electronics Program. I, I um, <clears throat> am a BSU graduate. And while I went to school, uh, college, I w uh, worked full time. So I worked at the Evergreen Crisis uh, Youth Shelter. I worked at the Gill Fillin Center. I also worked at the Northwest Juvenile Training Center working with adjudicated youth. Uh, from there, I um, taught high school at District 38, and I, then I became the communications director for Red Lake. After that, I worked in the uh, economic development department for Red Lake. Uh, also, uh, I was the sales and marketing manager for Custom Door Plant. I was the general manager for the uh, Modular Home Manufacturing Plant. Uh, from there, I went to, um, uh, I became a sales consultant for the sixth largest pharmaceutical company in the world. Uh, in between there, I was also the vice president for the Boys and Girls Club in Bemidji, and I was also on the board for the Evergreen House. Um, and then I came back to Red Lake. I'm currently the executive director for Oshki Majitata, which is New Beginnings in Ojibwe, where I uh, oversee and run six programs for the Red Lake Nation. Um, but one of the, the, the real, uh, the real um, part of um, my career has been I chaired the uh, Constitutional Reform Committee for almost three years. And I also was the president of the board for Red Lake Inc. And so I've been spending the last 30 years of my life uh, helping individuals and helping communities to uh, 
to become prosper and breaking down barriers for individuals. And so I just wanted to start off with my credentials and, and thinking why I uh, am the best candidate to serve District 2A. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Grussell, your opening comments. Okay, thank you. Good evening. I am Matt Grussell, and I'd like to thank the uh, Lakeland Public Television and the hosts and, uh, and such for inviting us here this evening and providing us the opportunity to discuss issues that matter the most here in the North Country, uh, that matter the most to the, the people, the families, and the communities of District 2A. I was born and raised in northern Minnesota. I, my family uh, is from Deer River. And I'm very proud to come from a legacy of service, a legacy of uh, a service that, that shaped my life. I had a father, my grandfather, he served in World War I, in, World War I in the U.S. Army. My father as well served in, in uh, the U.S. Navy in World War II. Several uncles served in, during the Korean conflict, the Korean War, and uh, two brothers served in the Vietnam War. Now during peacetime, uh, uh, an older brother and myself, we both served in the armed, armed forces as well. He in the Air Force and I in the U.S. Army. That legacy of service continues on with my children. Uh, two of them also served in the arm, armed forces. One serves as a nurse and, and does quite a bit of mission work as well. From the, uh, from the military, I went, off, went to school. I got my education and junior college. And then I went into a business for myself, driving truck over the road, supporting my family. After that, I felt the call to go back to school and finish up my law enforcement certificate. From there, I moved to uh, this district. I started off as law enforcement as chief of police in Black Duck, Minnesota. I served, uh, served a year there where I was uh, injured in the line of duty, shot in the line of duty. And I went from there after healing up Went from there to working on the Clearwater County Sheriff's Office on the Paul Bunyan Drug Task Force. I have been uh, serving in this district since 2001 on the front lines, trying to make this a better place for our families, for your families, uh, protecting your businesses, your schools, right on down the line. And, I have, and I've, it's been my honor to do so. I was called to, uh, to serve in law enforcement to protect and to serve, and I feel as though I'm called again to this service. Uh, my career was ended early in law enforcement, and now there's another call. The call to serve, to continue to serve the public in, in District 2A and the House of Representatives. You'll get nothing less than my best in the House of Representatives, and I'll be there to represent you. I'm not there for myself, I'm not there for a pat on my back. I'm there to do my job just as I did in law enforcement. And again, my goal is to cut taxes, reducing the regulations on, on farms, on farmers, to shrink the size of government, and to uh, protect our constitution. So again, I thank you for this opportunity to come and answer questions and to okay. look, for, look for support for the upcoming election. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Our first question is to Mr. Grussell and it's from Matthew Ledke. Um, recently there's been quite a bit of talk on the subject of Minsure uh, with um, some issues arising uh, regarding that uh, program. Uh, I was wondering if elected, um, where do you see the future of Minsure going and what are some solutions you might have for the uh, current issues it has? Okay, well, uh, the Minsure has, has definitely been an issue. And each place I go to knock on doors and visit with people, that topic comes up. Uh, recently, I, I talked to a, a young mother who has who uh, been improving their status as far as uh, getting better jobs, getting more income. And as soon as that happened, uh, their children were pushed off of Minsure. They were, they were dropped. Now, the, uh, they spent the past month or so trying to get their children covered again. But because of the, the uh, failures of Minsure, they have not been able to get them reinsured. 
the network, is, in her words, the network is either uh, saying it's compromised or it's down. And it has been very difficult for, for them to get any coverage back on their children. Another gentleman I talked to told me about uh, that at the end of the year, he's going to be dropped because of his single coverage by Blue Cross Blue Shield. And that is what uh, ensures uh, the high premiums have forced uh, insurance companies out. Uh, Minnesota did have a good, uh, excuse me, Minnesota did have a good uh, public uh, uh, insurance program. And uh, we, were ranked as, we were ranked among the top in the, state, in the United States. Uh, Mincher has come in and has taken us backwards. It has cost uh, the taxpayers millions of dollars. And in order to, in order to uh, make that right, in order to get that straightened out, we need to take Mincher and get rid of it, get rid of it completely. Um, that's the way I feel about it. And that will save uh, several million dollars, at least $23 million over, over three years. You know, and uh, cut it by cutting the tax in half. And then from there, uh, looking and exploring ways to get insurance companies back into the state to come back in and make it a, a, uh, a competitive market for better insurance programs. All right, well, thank you. Um, Mr. Loud, the same question. That's a great question. And having worked 10 years in the uh, pharmaceutical in industry, in the healthcare arena, and uh, which I covered Northwest Minnesota, we have wonderful doctors. Uh, they're amazing, they work hard, they, they, uh, they practice medicine and, uh, <clears throat> in the, the most uh, uh, ethical way. And so I, I am proud. I made a lot of friends uh, th through the industry. Uh, one of the things that we need to do is we definitely need to work on Minsure. So currently, right now, as the uh, executive director for Oshi Majitata in the TANF program, which is a temporary assistance for needy families, we are uh, in the process of taking over the health care healthcare portion from Beltrami County and it, it is a mess and so we do need to fix Minsure. Uh, in the Affordable Care Act there is a provision in uh, uh, section 1332 which provides Minnesota to create an in innovative way to fix this system and so um, one of the things that we can all agree on in healthcare is that uh, it needs to cover, uh, ensure that all people are covered, that they cover all types, uh, dental, vision, hearing, mental health, which was brought up earlier today, chemical dependency treatment, prescription drugs, uh, medical equipment and supplies, long-term care and, and uh, home care. And then we need to, all patients need to choose their providers, reduce the cost by cutting administrative bureaucracy. Uh, we need to set premiums based on ability to pay and we need to focus on preventive care and early intervention. And one of the things we could do is to talk about uh, more consumer awareness. And I think educating the consumer, the patients on how to prevent the uh, illnesses and diseases would, would cut costs tremendously. And we also need to uh, have uh, our Medica Medicaid, or we need Medicare to be able to uh, negotiate the pharmaceutical prices like Medicaid and the VA does. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Russell, any additional comments or rebuttal? No. Okay, Mr. Loud, any additional comments? Well, I just oh. wanted to say, you know, with that, following up on that, uh, doctors are practicing evidence-based medicine, and I sold the number one uh, antihypertensive in the, the, uh, uh, the world, and what it did is it reduced uh, the uh, hospital when the, the biggest cost for, for health care is hospitalization. So if you can find ways to reduce hospitalization, it will reduce our health care. Okay, thank you. Next question is from Mr. Loud, and it's from uh, Scott Hall. Thank you, Warren. There's a lot of bipartisan interest in Minnesota and around the United States to reform our criminal justice system. What reforms do you think we should try? And in that, uh, within your answer, maybe you can tell us what you think of drug courts. Well, that's a loaded question, and uh, <clears throat> I mean, the fastest way to reduce poverty, to reduce crime, 
is through education. And what we're doing at Oshki Majitata right now is we're uh, helping people break down barriers and we're working on successes. And so the, uh, the, the crime is uh, when you look on, when I worked at the Juvenile Training Center and you looked at the Beltrami County uh, area, it was 60% Native Americans. And you go into uh, the Beltrami County website right now, and it's still 60%. So we, we haven't, and, and I worked back in the, I, I believe it was like 1996, 97. And so we haven't had any progress. And so uh, <clears throat> one of the things, like I said, is education, getting people jobs, and uh, helping families break down barriers, and that will reduce the crime rate. All right, thank you. you. Mr. Gressel, same question. Would you repeat that again, please, sir? Sure, yeah. Thank um, you. What reforms do you think we should try to, uh, for our criminal justice system? And if, tell us what you know or think of drug courts in the context of reforming criminal justice. Well, the drug courts, I, I think, having been in law enforcement, Having worked uh, with the uh, uh, in the criminal courts, etc., um, the drug courts I thought were a, a positive step. Uh, it wasn't the it wasn't the uh, users that that I targeted as far as investigations, as far as building cases. It were the dealers. The dealers were the problem. The dealers were the ones that were bringing the poison into the areas, and and polluting the communities, poisoning the communities the children, the schools, right, right on uh, the families. But uh, so to have the drug court start and taking the people that were uh, first time offenders, um, user type offenses, et cetera, and helping them to uh, get, on, get on the right path, I thought was a, was a step in the right direction. Not everybody needs to go to jail. Not everybody needs to be locked up. And especially, you know, I thought the, the users and the uh, people, the first time offenders such as like that, um, you know, they deserved another break, another chance. They deserved a, uh, a break. So, and like I said, uh, it was the dealers that I primarily targeted in my investigations, et cetera. Um, but it boils down to the families. It boils down, it starts at home, it start, it, and it goes, carries over into the schools. Folks got to, uh, parents have to teach their children you know, to stay away from that kind of stuff, to teach them to uh, abide, by, abide by the laws. I grew up in a, in a time where you, where you respected the laws and you, and you abide by them. And uh, so it starts at home before it gets to the, before it gets to the stage of, of people being incarcerated, before it gets to you know, the youth running, running out and uh, getting in trouble and such. Um, and if you can't, you know, if, it, if you catch the youth, um, catch, them before, catch them before they get to that point. Get them into mentoring. Something that's going to help them get on the right track. All right. So, All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Loud, any additional comments or Yeah, rebuttal? I just want to add to the, uh, the drug court is a positive way for low offenders. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but in the Red Lake Nation right now, that if somebody comes up and is selling drugs on the Red Lake Nation and, and our Red Lake Police Department uh, uh, bust these guys, uh, we can't uh, try them in our own uh, court system. And so that's uh, one of the things that uh, the state of Minnesota can help the Red Lake Nation because uh, when you have a healthy Red Lake, you're going to have a healthy Minnesota. And so with the, uh, uh, the drug courts, I'm all for it for the low, low um, uh, offenders. But then uh, the dealers, just like what Matt said, we need to uh, prosecute them to the, the max. Mr. Gressel, any additional comments? Uh, yes. I worked on the Red Lake Nation on the Paul Inn Drug Task Force and the Safe, Headwater Safe Trails Task Force. Uh, we worked extensively alongside of uh, uh, the Red Lake Police Department and we made quite an impact. And yes, there were some, some folks that came from outside and brought narcotics and into the Red Lake Nation, but there's a lot of uh, folks that actually lived there as well that were bringing it in. So it is, you know, drug traffickers do not know borders. They don't know county lines. They don't know city lines. They don't know state lines. And so it's got to be a concerted effort of all law enforcement entities to, uh, to hit them where it hurts, go after them, go after the dealers. 
Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's move on to our next question. Mr. Grussell, uh, your question comes from Dennis Wyman. This is one of the uh, debates, one of the races where we do not have an incumbent. So either way, we're going to have a first time legislator representing this district. Do, who do you look up to as, as state legislators? Are, are there people that you would like to emulate that have served in the state legislature or, or in, the, at, in the U.S. House of, uh, or the Congress? Uh, like just curious who, who you guys uh, look up to. Well, you know, I'd have to say, I don't have anybody in particular in the House or uh, House representatives or in the state or actually at, at the federal level for that matter. Uh, the one that I would look up to and is, would, be, would be Abraham Lincoln. He was honest. He was there for the country. He was there to help the country as, as are most of our, as have been most of our presidents. And that is, that is what you'll have with me. I'll be upfront, I'll be honest. I may not sugarcoat things. I may be blunt, but uh, I believe that comes from uh, a career in law enforcement as well. I'll stand for what is right. I'll fight, I'll fight to the bitter end to, to protect and, and to serve this, uh, this district. So uh, I guess it would be, it, it would be the, the, presidents, uh, the presidents of old that, that I would really look to. All right, uh, thank you. Mr. Loud? Um, this whole process has been amazing. Um, and you definitely, uh, when times get hard, you definitely know who your support are, supporters are and your friends. And so uh, I have to, uh, I look up to uh, Senator Rod Scoey uh, as a mentor and uh, uh, Representative Paul Marquardt over on the uh, west end of Minnesota. And um, so those, those two gentlemen have showed uh, tremendous support and uh, I know I can lean on them uh, for any, th any question that I have uh, that, <clears throat> that comes up. But I can tell you this, is that I'm, I'm going in there, this is not gonna be a training ground for me. I'm gonna go in there running. I, I, I have uh, uh, chaired boards, I have chaired committees, I have worked with the federal government, I have uh, worked with the state and negotiated contracts with the state, so I, I'm gonna hit the ground running and I have some initiatives that I will be uh, passing and looking for on day one. And so I will be reaching out across aisles. One of the, the as a pharmaceutical rep, I covered Northwest Minnesota and I was able to make relationships with doctors that w wouldn't see anybody. And so I had people come in uh, up north here to, to see how I could build relationships and how I, and I can do that in St. Paul. I can work uh, with anybody and that has been one of my strongest points throughout my career is building relationships and uh, in education. You can see throughout my career uh, all my successes have been through education and so I'm going to continue to uh, lean on the experience uh, legislator and uh, we're gonna get some stuff done uh, in St. Paul. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gressel, any other additional comments or rebuttal? Um, no rebuttal, but uh, I'd just like to say that uh, I, I have to t backtrack a little bit and say that, and, and tell uh, Dave Hancock, thank you for uh, his support, and I do, I do, uh, I, I do look up to him, especially uh, he's been uh, uh, mentoring me along the way and uh, giving me some very uh, sound and godly counsel as, I, as I've uh, gone through this campaign trail. And along with uh, Steve Green, there's, those are uh, two men that have, really, that have really stepped up and have really uh, been very good, very supportive, and very helpful along, along this campaign. All right, uh, Mr. Loud, any additional comments or nope. rebuttal? Nope. Okay, then I'll move on to the next question, and this question is for Mr. Loud, and it's from um, Matthew Ledke. Uh, Mr. Loud, this question is regarding uh, LGA. I'm wondering, uh, if elected, um, what are your stances on uh, local government aid, and if you're in support of any increases to local government aid, uh, especially in this part of the state with um, uh, not as much taxable property? Uh, just give me one second here. Okay, uh, LGA. So the, the whole premise of LGA is to help 
uh, the counties, the cities that are a low tax base. And, and so the uh, appropriations for LGA, they need, and I support the, uh, the 2002 levels. And um, when, when you support the cities with, with the LGA, that uh, it, it will help lower property taxes. So in, in one sense, that's gonna help your farmers, the small farmers, it's gonna help your small businesses. And uh, of course, it's gonna help uh, cities be able to uh, look at their budgets because they're talking about uh, uh, law enforcement, fires, uh, uh, all the things that a city takes to run. And so I am supportive of increasing uh, the uh, LGA, the, uh, um, the local government aid to the 2002 level. And, um, you know, yesterday I was watching the uh, debates and they were talking about all of the, uh, you know, we have a lot of force in our area and, and uh, uh, District 2A has the largest water base. And so a lot of those things uh, will <clears throat> reduce the tax base. But by adding on the uh, LGA um, is, the, uh, is the way to go. It, it helps the lake homeowners and it, um, um, it, it will help lower the, the tax base, so. All right, thank you. And Mr. Russell, same question. I'm for, I'm for supporting the, the local municipalities and uh, helping them to uh, provide, uh, provide for the communities. Uh, in this past uh, legislation, I, I believe some of that uh, bonding bill was, was uh, supposed to go to the communities. Um, the bonding bill that the, the, government, the, the governor uh, stopped and, and quashed with the Southwest Light Rail. A lot, of that, a lot of that money was to go to infrastructure. A lot of that money was supposed to go to schools, et cetera. And it would have gone to help, you know, I agree with, I agree with Jerry on that, that it would have gone to help farmers, um, businesses, et cetera. So I'm for, I'm for helping uh, the communities and to help them to keep, uh, keep their municipalities going. Because if we, if we start losing our municipalities, uh, and they can't they can't continue on with the with uh, taking care of their the cities then you know people start moving away and we can't do that we can't afford that all right uh, mr. loud any additional comments yeah I want to just add a you know um, you know Matt and I we're, we're going we're vying for an open seat so uh, I'm not gonna go uh, tit for tat with him but the uh, what, what I understand about that bonding bill is that there was going to be zero outstate dollars that was going to contribute to the, the light rail project. And so, um, and, and so 50% of it was going to come from the federal government. Uh, that's like uh, $997 million. And the, the thing that we need to know is that money was not going to go back in the coffer. It was going to go to another state. I believe it was Colorado. And so uh, <clears throat> that's one. And then uh, that's 50%. And then 40% of it was going to come out of the local governments down in the metro area. And then the final 10%, which was the deal breaker, all of a sudden Hennepin County said they'll take and they'll spend the rest. So the, uh, the bonding bill could have been passed. And um, so that's what I, all the, uh, it would have been zero dollars for outstate in that bond, in that light rail project. All right, thank you. Mr. Gressel, any other additional comments? Minnesota, yes, I, I okay. do. Minnesota across the state would be forced to pay for the ongoing operating losses for Southwest Light Rail. When the capital costs, operating costs, the capital maintenance costs are totaled up, spread over 10 years, the cost per rider is over $25. That would have gone, that, that would have gone out to us to pay for. The current cost of Southwest Light Rail was was one one point one billion eight hundred and fifty eight million dollars construction, and that's uh, that would have gone to us. That would have gone to the taxpayers that have to pay for the the light rail would not have helped the congestion in in the metropolitan area. It would have saved uh, twenty seconds or eight seconds actually. I'm sorry, eight seconds a year over twenty years, and that's all it would have done. So I believe that uh, that money 
that uh, because that light rail was still in litigation and would not be mm -hmm. addressed until uh, September of 2017, that that bonding bill should have been passed okay. and the light rail should not have been considered at that time. All right, thank you. Um, we need to move on to the next question. Can I, can I, a lot, uh, you could, you have that. the one minute if you want. You yeah, need I'll use your one, one minute. minute here. Okay. So having lived uh, throughout the United States, I've lived in San Francisco, I've lived in Chicago, I've lived in Orlando, any uh, vibrant city has uh, an amazing uh, mass transit system. And so when you're looking at and you're thinking about, we need the metros, we need the cities. That brings in the economy and uh, we need to make sure they're healthy. And uh, we have the arts, we have the sports, go Vikings, and then <clears throat> we need mass transit. And, and so that would have brought in uh, jobs down there and, and uh, believe it or not, there are people in northern Minnesota that will go down and uh, hop onto a construction project for a year or two. I, I, I know many people that went down and, and helped on the construction in the, uh, on the stadium project. So to think long term and to develop a mass transit system is the way to go and we need a mass transit. And all uh, metro areas and mass transits are subsidized no matter where you go. It's going to be subsidized. And so eventually uh, that mass tr transit should be all over the metro area and it, it's, it's, a healthy, it's a healthy city. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question would go to Mr. Grussell and it's from uh, Scott Hall. Minnesota's two biggest utilities, Minnesota Power and XL Energy, are taking serious Minnesota's renewable energy goals by installing wind and solar energy systems. What's your vision for a clean energy future in Minnesota? Well, my vision for a clean energy future in Minnesota, um, I look at uh, the uh, North Star Electric in Budette. And I've, uh, I've visited with them and have uh, gotten uh, a, quite a bit of information from them. They, they meet, they have met and exceeded the uh, the challenges put before them for clean energy. And I believe that uh, they continue to work, they continue to experiment with the, with the solar, with the wind, with, uh, and I, I, but I don't know about hydro. So, but, uh, and their, and their uh, coal capacity, their coal burning, or their coal uh, usage for energy has been, uh, has met and exceeded all requirements by the state and the federal governments. So the, the future of it, I believe we need to stay with, uh, stay with what is stable, stay with what is dependable, and uh, keep experimenting, keep working on the technologies to improve uh, on the wind, to improve on the solar. Uh, from what I understood, the solar or the wind, um, you, can't cons you can't save that energy, you can't store that energy yet. So uh, when the wind is blowing at uh, uh, two, three o'clock in the morning, and that's when it's generating the power, you don't have anybody using it at that time. So there are, there are some things that need to be worked out. I agree with working towards uh, more efficient, uh, more uh, environmentally friendly forms of energy. But right now, uh, the most efficient and the most environmentally friendly and the most dependable is what we have, are the fossil fuels. So as long as they meet and continue to meet and to exceed um, the regulations that, that are asked of them, why change? Okay, Mr. Loud, same question. I've also been up to uh, the, the North Star in Budet, and uh, I was uh, pleased to find out that they are spending 40% of uh, the, the resources on renewable energy. Uh, we are not in the wind zone. Uh, in District 2A. And so solar is the, uh, the route to go. And when I came to uh, Oshimajitata four and a half years ago, I put four things on my whiteboard <clears throat> and uh, as goals, and I've, I've uh, hit three of them. And the last one was uh, renewable energy um, education. And uh, currently, right now, I am in the uh, process of building a vocational school uh, Oshkimanjitata Institute of Technology. And in there, currently we are uh, 
developing welders. We have a welding one and welding two class and uh, we are going to be innovative and our welding two class where North, Northland Community Technical College is going to be partnering with us because we're doing something that they've always wanted to do as, as far as uh, creating an entrepreneur uh, piece onto the trainings and uh, the vocational schools. But lo and behold, about six months ago, uh, the Red Lake Nation had an initiative to build a, uh, uh, a solar farm. And so within that solar farm, they're going to be developing solar panels. And, and uh, they are coming to us to ask us if we could help them develop a training program to build these uh, uh, solar panels. So I don't believe things just happen for a reason. I mean, we were both on two different planes and then all of a sudden it's all coming together. So uh, renewable energy and solar uh, is something that we need to invest in because not only when you're uh, talking about building uh, economic workforce housing, you can add, there's tax credits that you can apply to that and then you can add on uh, a renewable energy piece to that to encourage uh, not only uh, the, the natural resources, but then the innovation in the area. All right, thank you. Mr. Gressel, any additional comments? Yes. I believe that uh, we need to continue to look at uh, renewable energies, such as wind and solar. And, uh, but I do believe that since we are sitting on, uh, this country is so uh, vastly rich with its own uh, natural resources, that uh, the, the uh, Minn Kota, uh, Plants are meeting and exceeding all the regulations. Why not con continue to stay you know, with, with the dependable energy? The energy that is going to be there every day when you turn on the light, every day when you turn on that shower, it, it, every day that it's, it, it's, uh, it's dependability. And it's going to be, uh, if it goes down, it's going to be repaired quickly. So I, I, I do agree that we need to keep considering renewable energies, but we have to stick with what works. Okay, Mr. Loud, uh, any additional comments? Well, I don't disagree with the, uh, what works, but the, the thing about uh, what I've learned in the Ojibwe culture, and it is beautiful, is that we're always thinking seven generations ahead of time. And so the, uh, working on uh, renewable energy is not for us. It's for our children and our children's children. It's seven generations. And so that's the mindset we need to have. And so, um, we need to work on renewable energies and we need to push that and push it and push it and still help the local companies with the, uh, uh, the, the energy that we have now, of course. But uh, the, the long-term vision is to uh, become and using the natural resources. Thank you. Our next question is for Mr. Loud and is from Dennis Wyman. We uh, encourage our viewers who watch the debates to send in questions, and we also ask those at times. And if you're watching at home tonight, you can send those questions to us at debates at lptv.org. This is one question that was sent to us. Minnesota has job openings, but there is a skills gap between existing jobs and workers' experience. What is your position on funding higher education, both the U of M and the Minsk U systems, to train the workers our businesses need? That's a great question. Uh, if you look at the uh, current state budget, we're spending almost 50% uh, of our budget on education. And everybody knows that the fastest way to get an uh, individual, to get a family, and to get a community out of poverty, it's through education. And so I am a strong advocate, and like I said, all of my successes throughout my career has been uh, through education in one way or another. Um, <clears throat> And, and so the biggest factor right now for the higher education is student debt. And uh, we need to uh, address that. I mean, there's different ways that you can do it. People talk about the uh, forgiveness of uh, uh, debt relief. There's also uh, uh, tax credit. And then uh, um, we need to maybe even look at exempting uh, education on the uh, state income tax. I mean. There's got to be ways that we can work with uh, higher education and, and uh, um, currently what we're doing through Oshimajitata is we're breaking down barriers. And one of the big barriers is education through the families. So, um, and we're working on successes. 
one of the first things I'm going to do, uh, the bill that I'm going to put in, uh, back in 2013, uh, the state of Minnesota, the federal government changed the uh, GED, and the GED is just a uh, brand name. So the adult basic education program uh, got changed totally. And uh, what happened there is that they uh, changed the tests and they changed the format. Well, one of the things uh, happened. One of the things that happened is that uh, the the GED graduation rate went. Uh, it hit the it, it hit the floor, and it's not only on Red Lake, but it hit the floor nationwide through Minnesota. And uh, one of the things they told me down because uh, I addressed this and uh, to the commissioner of education, we brought tribal nations together to find out why we weren't uh, a part of it uh, in figuring out what the solution is. And, and so one of the things we did is that uh, we brought this together and, uh, and we come up with a solution to, uh, um, uh, 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 to become a three test states. And, and I'll, okay. I'll- Okay, thank you. Mr. Grussell, same would, question. Would you repeat that question, please? Yes, the question is Minnesota has job openings, but there is a skills gap between existing jobs and workers' experience. What is your position on funding higher education, both the U of M and the Minsky systems to train the workers our businesses need? Okay, uh, to meet that, uh, to meet that, uh, that disparity, uh, I, I believe we need to uh, expose our, our kids in, uh, at the high school levels and uh, to the industrial eds. Get industrial eds back, back going in the, in the high schools. Uh, I remember that in the days when I was when I was in high school, we we had uh, metal shops, we had welding shops, we had uh, uh, woodworking, et cetera, all all down the line. Um, my sister benefited from the uh, the the nursing program where she got exposed to the the profession of of, of working as an LPN. Well, it, it, you know, as uh, got trained by uh, an RN to work in the nursing field. So those are the types of things we need to expose expose the young people to. Um, again, get it back into the schools. Um, as far as, uh, as, far as uh, the, the work field, uh, I would say to encourage businesses to start, uh, start programs where they get some, they get some uh, tax relief or tax breaks uh, for uh, having uh, uh, programs to bring people up to speed, training programs to uh, bring people in that do not meet quite, do not quite meet the qualifications that they need, but at least they can train them there and, and to benefit from bringing people in to train them there. Um, also, I, I would say to allow our veterans to use the GI Bill for uh, other types of licenses and certificates and uh, to allow them to uh, benefit and to uh, grow when they, when they come back out in the public sector. And again, I, I agree with uh, Jerry on, on the uh, debt relief. If you give, if you uh, offer to the students that if you work in this field for five years, that 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 your debt will be uh, canceled. You know that is a way to get people back into get them get them into that field and get them going. Uh, so that would be that would be uh, another way. Thank All right. you. All right, thank you, Mr. Loud. Uh, any yeah, other comments? Yeah, I just uh, I kind of got it. I, I'm really passionate about it, so I got a little uh, brain freeze there. But one of the things that uh, this is gonna do, uh, again, is like I'm in it every day. We're breaking down barriers. And, and by doing that, it just created a wall for the people that don't need it, that didn't need it the, the most. And so uh, one of the ideas about the, uh, the GED piece was to uh, grandfather uh, the, the 2013 and the uh, go 10 years back and to uh, bring those test scores in because what they did is they, they took, uh, uh, it used to be five tests, they broke down the four. They took the written test part of it away and then they uh, incorporated in three of them. And so um, <clears throat> by doing that, you're gonna get people that are going to, because uh, a GED, what that is, is just a key on, the key for their next step in their career. And so by having them accomplish that, feeling a sense of accomplishment, they're going to go on to higher education, whether it's a vocational school, hopefully it's a Oshkemajitata Institute of Technology. And, 
<clears throat> and go on to college. Uh, BSU is a great place, uh, uh, the best choice ever. I can't remember the tagline, but anyways, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Grussell, any other comments? Just to add to what I was saying before, um, the, the, vo the Votex, they need to be go back to, go back to being Votex, uh, vocational schools, and uh, not geared so much towards, uh, towards uh, the four-year four school. A lot of kids go there to, to get their credits and then go off to a four-year school. And some of the monies uh, have, you know, some of the Votex have been affected by that. They're gearing more towards that than what they were set up to do. So I believe that the, that mm -hmm. the Votex need to uh, get brought, ba brought back into concentrating on those trades types fields. There's, there's, a, there's a definite need out there for that type, for that type of workforce. And uh, I just, uh, and, and a lot of students in high school, they won't go off to a four-year school, but they work, they work very well in those types of fields. So I would, I would say we need to encourage and need to help Votex get back on course. Thank you. Oh, all right, uh, next question is for Mr. Uh, Grossel, and that is from uh, Matthew Ledke. Mr. Grossel, this question is regarding uh, transportation. Um, in the past bonding bill from 2016, there was some money put aside for um, transportation funding, but would you support, if elected, a longer term transportation bill, a large scale uh, transportation bill for the state's infrastructure? And subsequently, would you also be willing to support a gas tax to go along with that? Hmm. Okay. The transportation, the, the transportation bill. Um, you know, I don't, I don't believe there's a there's a need for uh, a raise in the gas tax. We have uh, we have in the state we pay enough taxes as it is, and to continue to to raise taxes, uh, we're going to continue to. Uh, Fleece, fleece the people in our district. And there's, a, there's, there's no reason to do that. The tax, relief, uh, the tax relief bill that was supposed to go out would have given tax relief and, and long-term tax relief to uh, farmers, veterans, families, college graduates, and small businesses. And that was, uh, that was uh, $800 million in tax cuts over the next three years, included half a billion in ongoing permanent tax relief which, which should have been done in, during the regular session, but it was stopped. Now that bonding, tra that bonding and transportation, that was more than 700 million in roads and bridge uh, funding, including uh, a lot of key regional uh, projects, uh, such as Highway 14, 23, and 12, uh, that won't be funded. In addition to the roads and bridges, the bonding bill invested in smart transit options, including Funding the, uh, funding the state's share for the Orange Line Bus Rapid Transit connecting Minneapolis, Richfield, and Bloomington. Um, if, if we're going to extend that even further than, than what the bonding bill said, it would have to, it, it would have to be in, in a way that it wouldn't raise taxes on our Minnesota families. They are burdened to death, as it is, with, with taxes. And it, it would not be fair to, to burden them further. Um, we, we in the House are, uh, are to be good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. We are to be good stewards of all the dollars. But especially when it's somebody else's, when it's all of our, our constituents' uh, tax dollars, we need to keep that in mind. We need to keep them in mind, their best interest, what's going to be best for them. Thank you. Mr. Loud, the same question. So we have a $600 million deficit in our roads and transportation. I uh, went to the uh, Beltrami County uh, Commissioner's Forum, and their number one issue was transportation. And so uh, <clears throat> we're going to have to get the money from somewhere. And I do believe in a, t a gas tax, and w but we need to do it equitable. And so if you have the metro area uh, and the um, St. Paul, Minneapolis, the, their gas tax should be a little higher than ours because one of the things that would do, uh, it would actually encourage people to come up to northern Minnesota 
to relax and to enjoy what the what we we uh, experience every day and so uh, and i'm just just throwing out ideas and so if we do an, an equitable gas tax where the metro area is an increase of uh 15 cents uh, smaller cities, 10 cents, and in northern Minnesota, a 5 cents, and then spread those dollars around. I think that is a, a great topic of a discussion down in the House. And so, um, 10 cents, a 10 cent increase in, in uh, the gas tax would only uh, increase the uh, transportation budget by 300 million. So, we're going to have to uh, uh, think about innovative ways to. Uh, uh, our roads and bridges. All right. Well, again, we've run out of time this evening, and so we're going to need to move uh, on to closing comments. Each candidate has uh, two minutes for closing comments. And uh, up first is uh, Mr. Gressel. Well, I'd first like to, I'd first like to thank you for this opportunity to uh, Discuss some of the uh, some of the uh, concerns that are that are uh, weighing most heavily on the hearts of of uh, the folks here and uh, the folks throughout the district. Uh, this is the first time I've ever run for a political office, but like I said before, you'll get nothing but 110 percent from me. I will uh, I will stand firm on what I know is right, and what and what is best for. Uh, District 2A and for the state of Minnesota. I won't back, I won't back down from, uh, from other pressures or outside pressures and I will do the best job that I possibly can for you. Again, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank all of those who have been helping throughout this campaign um, and uh, giving support, giving uh, counsel, etc. One thing I'd like to leave, leave you with is just a quote from a quote from uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer that uh, the silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. So I just stand here, I, well, I sit here before you and I encourage you, do not, sit on, do not sit on your hands this election. Come out and vote your conscience. Come out and stand for what is right come out and speak out for what is right and what you believe. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Loud, closing comments. Hey, I'm not a, a politician either, and I'm going to go a little old school on you. This is my first uh, briefcase that I uh, ever owned, and it was, uh, it, I brought it from Hawaii. And uh, I was managing an automotive shop there, which I'm really proud of. <clears throat> and. Uh, one of the things that uh, they came out and did an article on how I turned that shop around, it was the best kept secret on, on the island. Uh, another thing that I'm proud of is I was able to get into the pharmaceutical industry and, and there it, it took me four attempts at, in, in uh, the sixth largest pharmaceutical company. And so what you had to do is, is you had to go around and you, you brought a brag book and, and it, it talked about your accomplishments and, and what you can do uh, <clears throat> for the company. And so, and I haven't updated this. This is uh, uh, back a few, day, or a few years ago, and uh, I have a lot of accomplishments, and that's what I'm running on. This is, uh, <clears throat> this is not gonna be a training exercise for me when I get down to the house. And so, uh, I just want uh, people to uh, uh, look at both candidates, uh, and uh, Matt's a good guy, and, uh, um, and, and, uh, but it's about who can get the job done. It, it, you know, you're only down there for two years, and so I can hit the ground running immediately. I, I'm talking about the first bill I'm gonna, going to uh, uh, present is the uh, adult basic education requirements. Um, <clears throat> and then there's something else we didn't talk about is the Highway Trust Fund, which is a... Uh, fun and how they determine, you know, what the usage of gas tax, the tabs and stuff like that. Uh, if you weren't aware, that only, those dollars are for cities that are 5,000 uh, in population or above. And so what we need to do is to change that distribution for uh, the smaller cities, which is District 2A. Um, <clears throat> and then I, there's another initiative that I wanted to uh, talk about and get a chance to, 
It's to uh, start an initiative called Startup North, and uh, which would we encourage businesses that that are uh, wanting to build and, and uh, invest in the communities. So uh, I didn't get a time to, to say that, but um, just remember, on November 9th, when the elections are over and you've chose one or the other, we all become Minnesotans. Uh, we're not a Republican, we're not a Democrat. And so we need to send somebody down there that can get the job done. And I'm asking for your vote on November 8th to vote loud for a, a fresh voice for Minnesota's future. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And again, I'd like to take this time to thank the candidates for participating in tonight's debate. I have great Thanks. admiration for individuals who are willing to serve our communities and our great state of Minnesota. Now remember, we have another debate coming up here at Lakeland Public Television. Uh, if you missed any portion of tonight's debate and would like to watch it again, it will be available on Lakeland Public Television website within 24 hours. That website is lptv.org. Also, to read a recap of tonight's debate, you can pick up a copy of tomorrow's Bemidji Pioneer or log on to the Bemidji Pioneer website at bemidjipioneer.com. You can also listen to audio of the debates at kaxe.org. Um, coming up next is at 9 p.m. is House 2B, Brian Clabundi and Representative Steve Green. Uh, good night and thank you. Thanks, guys.